Are you new to events or maybe you're new to the side of event production and maybe you've been tasked with having to hire someone to help you with your event production and you're curious about what show calling is? Well, you're in luck. One of my favorite roles on events is being a show caller, but I used to be in your shoes where I had no idea what it meant or you know what a show caller even does or what is show calling. And so this is going to be a fun crossover this week where I'm actually going to be sharing an episode of the Better Events podcast that I talk about in all of my videos. I co-host it with Mary Davidson, and we had an amazing episode 40 where both of us really dive into the nuts and bolts of what is a show caller, what does it mean to be a show caller, and this is just something that's helpful for you if you are looking to either become a show caller, or you're just curious about what that role is, or you need to hire someone to be a show caller and you want to be a little bit more in the know of exactly what they're doing so that you know that you're hiring the right person. I also have some great links in there. um, And if you want to send us an email, you can get my free template for my run of show. Um, It's a great resource. A lot of my fellow event professional uh, colleagues use it because it's just so, so helpful. But anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode. And you can listen to the Better Events Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Better Events Podcast. Join two event strategists, Logan Clements and Mary Davidson, who believe we can all create, host, and attend better events. In this podcast, you will learn about event strategy and actions that you can use today as an event host, planner, or manager. Hear directly from the people who are creating innovative and inspiring events today and tomorrow and grow your business along the way. Now, let's get started and thanks for listening to the Better Events Podcast. And we're back. Uh, I'm Logan Clements, one of your co-hosts with the Better Events Podcast. And I'm joined by my colleague, Mary Davidson. How are you doing today, Mary? Doing good. Yeah. It's a winter day, so I'm doing as good as I can. <laughs> Yeah, trying to stay trying to stay warm and positive with a, with a little bit of the clouds that Seattle and the Washington area have in the winter time. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. But all is good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well for the start of it. You know, we're we're cruising in the beginning of 2022. Still feels weird. I feel like it's going to take me like at least till March to get used to saying it. But um, I did want to kick us off with a little bit of an icebreaker before we jump into our episode about show calling. And this is one that I got inspired by the Event Tech Podcast. I think if you're anyone who works in production, it's a pretty, or virtual events or in-person events, it's a great podcast. And their hosts were talking about how you first need to get good with old tools before using something new just for the sake of being new, which I thought was really interesting. And so, Mary, I'm very curious, what is a piece of old or outdated technology or practices that you can't give up? Like, for example, thinking if you're someone who used like the original iPod still to listen to music. This is a a good question, and I struggled. I was trying to think. I was, like, going through everything I use on a regular basis because I was, like, I have, like, my phone from high school, and I can't get rid of it, but it's not like I'm using it. And so the best thing I could come up with was just um, hardwired headphones, which is ironic because I'm not using them at this very second. But for anything other than podcasting, I'm on a walk. I'm even on a Zoom call. I'm using my hardwired headphones with the microphone, like the classic iPhone headphones that come with your phone. And I can't get past it. I don't know what it is. It's it always works. It never fails me. It never gets disconnected. It's annoying. The cords are annoying, but it sounds better than AirPods. So that's mine. <laughs> what about you? I like that. That's so great. Um, this one I don't use all the time, but I still like listening to like FM radio on road trips. Um, I did this a couple, I didn't do it on my last road trip I took, but the one before it was actually really fun because like the radio goes out of, you know, certain stations, you don't get them anymore when you're driving far enough and then you have to find a new station. And it was just really fascinating to like hear what other people are listening to um, yeah. versus like listening to Spotify or a podcast, which I'll do for like shorter walking around. But the radio was one. And then the other one that's not technology was I still use a paper planner, like how I plan my days and my to do's and things like that. And I do have a you know, my Google calendar, my Apple calendar, I'm trying to look into some project management software, but like the best for me is like hand writing everything down. And I've talked about in other episodes, my passion planner, but I've, I've bounced to a couple different options. So might not be the most efficient, but I'm, I don't think I'll ever give it up even as we get more tech savvy. Yeah. And this is kind of a a sidebar, I guess, but you brought up radio before and 
I have been thinking about radio lately. I don't know why, but it's interesting because it has been around for a long time. And as far as technology goes, and it's still around and it blows my mind, especially because maybe it's, maybe it's because I personally am more involved in the the tech world than I have been ever before because of the pandemic and virtual events, but uh, things just keep changing. And now we have the metaverse, but we also still have the radio and that's pretty cool. It is. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. And I also, I did bitch. I listen. there's a station in Philadelphia that plays Christmas music all the time. And when I was a kid, I used to like look forward to the, listening to the station when like I was Like all year homework. round? No, only oh, okay. Christmas time. Yeah, but each year it, it was getting earlier and earlier and they would let you like yeah. vote on their website for how soon you want to listen. It was B101, which I think now has been rebranded to something else, but it's still 101.1 um, in Philadelphia. And so, yeah, lots of fond memories of radio time. So if you're still using a old outdated pieces of technology or an old quote unquote, depending on what generation you're in, uh, don't feel ashamed because they're great. Um, but yeah, Mary, you want to jump into kind of why we're going to talk about show calling today? Yeah, definitely. So show calling, we're talking show calling 101. We are going to get a breakdown on what it is, why you need it, when you use it. And Logan is a pro at this. So I'm going to be kind of in the interview seat today learning about it. And I am really excited to Logan. I had a kind of a flashback because I realized um, for the event retreat we did last year at QS, Here's my plug for it, by the way. It is coming back in 2022, so stay tuned. But uh, we were supposed to have Logan come because she wasn't able to attend, unfortunately, but she was going to uh, video call in and teach us about show calling. But then I think we had like, it was just like schedule conflicts, so we couldn't make it happen. And so I thought, oh my gosh, this is our moment. (laughs) Finally, I can learn about it. So yes, I am excited, excited to learn. And we chose this topic because we think that it's a necessary skill show calling is when you have a virtual hybrid or person event team and depending on the complexity of the show you need you may need two show callers for a hybrid event so we are here to break down what it is what kind of people like it and tips for becoming a show caller so amongst all those wonderful things we will dive right in logan and we like to once again start off at the basics so what is a show caller yeah i think um and you might hear different terms. Some people call the a show caller is someone who like cues your production, your live production. So this could be your in-person show, your virtual show. It is someone who's kind of cueing people for what happens when. Um, and if we want to, we have some episodes I know that talk about, you know, wedding planning and the wedding industry. This could be your wedding planner who is telling the bride and groom when to walk down the aisle. They are cueing people on what to do. You might also hear it called a producer. And I will caveat if you're someone newer to the industry, we throw around these terms. But what I've found time and time again is everyone kind of has different definitions. So I've been hired for a show before as a producer and then found out later we have a show caller and I'm just, as a producer, I'm like managing the client and then the show caller is kind of below me and I'm relaying information and then they're the one queuing the show. Um, So you do need to always clarify what the roles or expectations are because you might assume one thing and then it's actually the other. But essentially show calling, you are the director, you are the The best analogy I use, and I've used it on this podcast before, is you're a conductor in the orchestra. So the orchestra has all the people who play their instruments really well, and the conductor doesn't necessarily play an instrument, but they are cueing each section on when to come in, when to stop, and they're kind of coaching them, and they practice and everything, but they're the ones cueing during the show. This is interesting to me, and I'm glad you brought up the jargon piece because as – once again, I'm reacting to this in real time because I don't know a lot about show calling. But as you're saying it, you're like – some people call it production, and I'm like – I've produced virtual events. So it's like, so this is all just coming together in my mind, but it's interesting. Um, So just to dive a little bit deeper into that, do you know, like, let's say someone is listening and they're like, well, show calling so far sounds interesting. Hopefully it continues to sound interesting as you keep listening to this episode, but they might want to learn more about it. If they like Google show calling jobs or something like that, is that going to come up? And I'm asking because I actually did a little Google and it was kind of hard to find. And so I think we, this is the different jargon piece. So yeah. Yeah. So that's about a little more. Yeah. yeah. You really can't, um, you can't really Google it to be honest. And okay. I guess I should just start with how I found out about show calling was because I was a part of a live sporting event on the entertainment side. And I got to experience having a show caller, having a producer, you would call it, We, I think we called them on that project. But then as I've kind of dug in, some people call them self-producers, some call themselves show callers, but it's just, again, it comes down to like, what is the, the role is they are the one queuing people. And the more complex the event you're doing, the probably the fact that you'll actually have a show caller who is someone who's just giving cues. But like you said, Mary, like if you've done an event by yourself, 
You've probably been a show caller apart from the fact that you're not verbally telling yourself what to do. Um, but essentially the show caller is giving the, they're the verbal cues. You're usually on a headset. If you're in person, you'll have like a radio. Mary and I have worked shows where we've done it just on a phone call between the two of us. Um, you can do it with, there's all kinds of like virtual technology. Another one I love to use is discord. Um, so you're right, Mary. It's something that's not like easily Googleable, or if you're in the event industry, I feel like you're not going to know this is an option for you in terms of skills, unless you are experiencing being on a team with someone who's like, oh, I'm a show caller or they're doing something you like. And so I would say you'd like show calling if you're someone who likes keeping track of multiple things at once, because back to my conductor analogy, you kind of have to know what everyone should be doing at one time. You know, the, and by that, I mean, you need to know what the lights should be doing. What's the music? What's happening on the video board? Are my speakers ready? You know, you're thinking about multiple things as your event's going on. Um, if spreadsheets are your jam, we've talked about that on the podcast. If our run a show, like you're going to live and die by your run a show or your cue sheet, sometimes it's called, or Mary and I, you and I are working on a project together right now where they call it a show flow. Again, the jargon, it all, all depends, but it's just the, the, the sheet that tells you what happens when, um, and then my last one, you'll like show calling. If you don't mind having multiple voices in your ear. So often the show caller is like kind of the the determining voice and be the one who's probably talking the most, but you're also going to be probably getting multiple inputs from different people. And I say that because I also know some event folks who hate that. <laughs> so if that is something that really bothers you, um, then you might not be as interested in show calling, but I know I love it because I enjoy taking in those multiple inputs and thinking about multiple things at once and needing to be like the calm person telling everyone, you know, how we're supposed to do it at what time and reacting to that in real time. Um, and I do think it's a skill that maybe makes me not the best listener in real life, but makes me a good listener with my job because <laughs> I'm able to hear chatter and like glear out what I need to listen to and what I can kind of tune out um, during with the event chatter on headset. Honestly, if that's that's what I have thought before when I've been on events with, with a show caller. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then people are asking them questions while they're trying to call a show and it's like, good for you. <laughs> It's a lot, but it's exciting. Like just thinking about it does make me excited too, because it's like the day of rush that comes and it's all coming to fruition. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. So uh, another follow-up question on something you said, when, what does show calling look like in person versus virtual? Um, I've seen it virtually. That sounds like what you kind of explained, like over a platform like discord or unity or a phone call. Um, so you can communicate with each one with each other. Mm -hmm. But when you're in person, it sounds a little bit more intense. Or I've seen photos of people doing it in person and it seems way more intense. So what's the difference? Yeah, I think in person, I think there could be, there's more moving parts because when you're doing a virtual event, often some of like we, we do those speaker tech checks. So you're not necessarily in control of the lighting. You might be in control of some of the microphones, but often like some of that stuff's on the speaker versus in person, you're giving cues to your audio tech, you're, you're like, and again, the jargon is like, they call them an A1 is your like lead audio tech. A2 is the next one down, but you're, you're cueing them on what microphones to un, unmute or mute. Um, you're cueing speaker stage managers for when they're pushing a speaker on stage versus in a virtual event, you'd be cueing the speaker probably directly because you're all virtual. Um, so there tends to be a couple more moving parts. But that being said, it's also, I would say a little easier too, because you're in person. So you can physically see people if they're having an issue or they're not able to communicate. I will say virtual has its challenges because sometimes you can't tell if someone's like on mute or uh, some of our, our events, I feel like we've worked together, Mary, have been a lot of hurry up and wait. So it's been a lot of cues when we're transitioning. And then it's just a speaker talking for 30 minutes. And I often get, I found I get anxious if it's too quiet on headset, <laughs> because to me, that means something's wrong usually. And they don't, and someone doesn't want to say something, but uh, uh, you know, often it's just someone's either on mute by the accident or they're just not, not there. Um, but you don't have those visual cues either. Cause that's something to, there's only so many things you can say. And when you're in person, you can kind of do, you know, points and you can use eye contact and like wearing a mask right now on site makes it hard, but you can, um, you have a little bit more flexibility in person than you do virtually where you really have to be good at like what your verb, what you are saying. Cause that's all people are getting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, um, another question I had kind of about that was, how do you, if you're doing an in-person event, how do you make sure you're not heard 
I don't know if that's a silly question, but it's something I think about. If you're calling, verbally calling a shot, you said a lot of it's eye contact, right? But if you are verbally doing something, is it just a big enough space and you're kind of siloed in your own little area where you can... Yeah, you're usually Me? siloed. You have, if you're watching us on YouTube right now or actually on Spotify with our video podcast, you're going to see I'm wearing big headphones. Um, these don't have a microphone attached. I'm using an external mic, but often you'll have big over-the-ear headphones and then a microphone that comes down um, in front of your mouth like a like you'll see on game controllers or if you remember yeah. 90s pop stars kind of thing. Um, so you're not necessarily having to like <laughs> lean into a mic. <laughs> so it follows you around, um, which is kind of nice. You don't feel like you have to like, you're not yelling, you're just talking. And often if you have music or again, my show calling experience is, um, I guess it's varied. I was going to say it's, it's majority. I've done some in sports, but I've done it for corporate and I've done it for nonprofits. So there's often things happening around you. So it's not like it's total silence. Um, I have had to cue like a national anthem and that you're usually quiet before and quiet after. So I'm not like yelling my cue into my microphone. I'm just talking at a normal level. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's not too hard. Um, I will say, I, I think the only other thing to think about when you're at an in-person event and show calling is people can still see you if they can't hear you. Um, so just maintaining an act of you know, calm, even if something's going wrong or something's not happening like it should, or, you know, whatever it is, people can still visually see you, but often like the tech team, we're in like the back corner or to the side, or you're kind of, and we're all, you know, we're not supposed to be really seen. Um, mm -hmm. but usually, but depending again on the venue, you're, you're sometimes there. And I guess I do want to go back one thing with verbal, um, we're talking about jargon. You might also hear this person to refer to as like your technical director. I'm working with an AV company right now that calls it a technical director. So once again, if you don't, if you feel like you're not sure what we're talking about, one, you could hire someone like Mary and I to help you figure it out, but also just like ask questions for like, what does this person do to make sure that you're covered? Cause you do want to make sure that you don't have all the right people in the right place and then like not have a conductor because that orchestra maybe could figure it out, but it's probably not going to be as well of a, you know, of a performance as if they had someone up there kind of conducting them through everything. Yeah, I think that's a good call out for what we've talked about before. And that is like the discovery call or one of the first calls you have with a potential client as you're trying to figure out their needs for the event, confirming jargon. I've, I've heard that somewhere. I think I heard it outside, you know, of us. I feel like I heard someone else say it and I wrote it down because I was like, that's good because people call stuff different stuff. And it gets way confusing. So shout out to that. That's a great idea. Um, So kind of transitioning more into obviously the same topic, but more kind of down a different segue. So how do you show call? Which is a huge question. So we can start off with the pre-show or however you want to start. Yeah, I think it's a good a good, a good place to start. Um, we do have, I think for pre-show when you're being the show caller, again, it depends on the client on the project. Sometimes you create the cue sheet, the run of show. Other times it's given to you and you're just calling off of it or giving the cues off of it. But my, I always start there. Um, and Mary, do you remember what episode our run of show episode was? I'm blanking now. But if you go back and look, I want to say it was in our early can find out <laughs> tens or teens i think it was like um, five i don't know okay but you should go back and listen to our run a show episode it really complements what i'm talking about now episode five. episode five um and this can be something as simple as an excel doc a shared google doc uh fancier shows use a software that i know of called Showflow, but it also only works if like your company has a Showflow software account so i haven't really used that as much our, um, if you send us an email at bettereventspod at gmail.com, we can send you our run of show template if you'd like to utilize that. But the cue sheet um, run of show is really just something that breaks down everything that's happening. So it gives you a start time, an end time. You'll see TRT, total run time for your event. It gives you timing and you can get as specific or as broad as you want. I found if you're doing something that is very intensive on the show calling side, meaning you have a lot of elements happening, a lot of things to happening, where you have to be very precise with your timing, um, making sure that you get it down to like the second. I don't go as deep as the middle of a second, but I will probably get down to the second of what, how things are timed out and then have a column for every individual thing that's happening. So like lights, if you have a big video board or projection screen, what's happening there? What's your music? If you have anything virtual happening, um, having a separate column for each, because think about your team, you'll probably have one person on lights and it's very helpful for that person just to have to look at one column on your big crazy run sheet and say, oh, this is what I'm responsible for. This is when it happens versus like making very complicated descriptions. Or if you did this on a word doc, it wouldn't be as easy to skim and understand as an individual player, where's my, my role? Or if I'm the lighting guy, okay, it's lights on, lights off. It's lights at this, at our show level. Okay. And then lights off again, you know, having it all in one column makes it very easy to understand 
everybody's roles, um, if that yeah. kind of makes sense. Totally. And if so, if you're listening to this and you're used to creating around a show, especially if you've been listening to the, our podcast for a while, since this was one of our earlier episodes. Um, and so to me, it's motivating because you're like, you're like almost there. You've already created it. The, the difference, or I guess the next step would be to have a role where you're actually verbally, you know, calling that out, those cues out. And I also want to shout out, re-shout out what Logan just shouted out, which was episode five of our podcast on Run of Show. And I'm doing that because it's actually one of our most requested templates. Like one of the emails we get, it's highly requested. So feel free to email us and ask for it. Like she said, we're happy to share it with you. And it's solid. It's really good. Thank you, Logan. It, I, I use it and I love it. And it's amazing. And much it's better, great. like you said, than a Word document. Oh, my goodness much better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's really helpful. I will say again, it's not perfect. I've definitely tweaked that from different run of shows I've come across. So the best part about, I think our template is it gives you a starting point. And then from there you can customize it based on however you want to organize your information. But I often find having a blank document is overwhelming versus having a template um, is super helpful. But another one I would say pre-show is you really need to confirm your equipment and your tech needs with the rest of the team. So in what way, like Mary and I have talked about of how will you contact your production team during the show? So how are you going to be giving them those cues? I would always prefer a verbal option. So Mary and I at the very base level have just done like a phone call. I've also done it in Zoom and the whole production team for a virtual show, we're all in Zoom together. Um, I've used Unity, which is an app and you can use that on site, which is cool. And then I've used hardwired um, like radios that actually have two channels and a headset for on site things. Um, but anything verbal is way better than texting. I've tried, I've done events where I've been a volunteer and they're like, we'll just text you cues. And it's just really hard to know if the person's typing, if they just aren't looking at their phone, if they're actually doing what you're saying they're doing versus a verbal confirm, the, the amount of time you need to confirm that is so, so much faster. Um, and so I highly, highly recommend that, especially if, but don't think you have to be really complicated if you have a show that's only two people. Mary and I have done virtual fundraising events where she's been show calling and I'm helping on the fundraising side or with chat and just us being on a phone call that she can kind of prompt me, hey, drop this in the chat, or I can call out someone made a big donation is hand, you know, way better than us trying to text that or chat it to each other. Um, and then my other one would be scenario planning. This is with your team as well as your client. So my favorite question to ask is, you know, what to do if we have tech issues or what to do if a speaker is running late? Do we postpone the show and, you know, do we kind of stall or do we just move on? What if a speaker's talking for too long? Are we going to interrupt them and have the MC come in and take them off stage? Or are we going to just let them talk? Um, what if somebody's on mute? What if our live stream stops? Uh, right now, my hybrid question is always, what's your which does your hybrid in a hybrid event, does your virtual audience or your in-person audience take priority or are they both equal? And if they're both equal, you know, you'll have to talk through that more. But I say that because if the live stream stops, are you going to interrupt your on stage person at the in-person event and say, Hey, can you stall while we get our live stream back up? Or are you going to continue on and just apologize to your virtual audience? You know, you, you rejoin when you're able to rejoin, but these are really important to think about ahead of the show, because then if you've already talked about it, during the show, your whole team will know, oh, this is what we've decided we're doing versus that panic of, oh, no, something has gone wrong. What do I do? So it just helps you react faster, I found, um, than just avoiding talking about it. Yeah, definitely. Many lessons learned with that one. So awesome. So what about during the show? What does that actually look like? Yeah, as you get closer to show, um, one of the things that I like to do, especially if you're new, because this is, again, we're talking about show calling 101, um, is think about your cues. So if you're about to call your first show ever, or maybe you've realized you've been doing it, but you just haven't thought about it, um, is you really need to think about how can you be more efficient with your words, which I know, Mary, we have a podcast. I always feel like that, you know, we're like, how do we be more efficient with what we're trying to say? But with show calling, it's even more important. So like you have to have a trigger word for someone to do something. So whether we've heard take go, but usually you would say stand by to change music or stand by to mute cam one and unmute cam two. And then your trigger word is the word you're saying that the person knows, okay, here's when I hit my button. Here's when I do what I'm supposed to be doing. And so you can say take or go. Um, and then knowing if you're going to count people in, if you're going to say, okay, stand by to change music, five, four, three, two, one, go. And on go, they know that they're going to change the music. 
Um, it's just really helpful to practice. Honestly, when I was first getting started and I still do this sometimes if I'm working with a new team is I'll print out my run of show and I'll literally just talk to myself and then make notes for myself. If I need to remind myself, oh, I have to cue this. And then two seconds later, I have to cue that. Or these two things have to happen at the same time because you want to make sure that you're not fumbling of, oh, uh, okay, we're going to need to change the music soon. And, um, oh, and the lights should be changing. Oh, oh no, change them, change them. They should have changed. Like that's not efficient from a, if you're listening to that, that's not helpful. So you want to kind of be like a good coach, a good conductor and have cues and then talk through those cues with your team ahead of time again. So they know what's the word because we've said, it, we'll keep saying it again. The jargon is different. Every show caller I found has different tweaks. They do producer. Some, some people come in and say, my word is go. I will give you a three count and nothing else. And that's it. I'm a little bit more collaborative, I like to think, or I kind of adjust my style to the team because I'm open to whatever they're comfortable with, but kind of going through your cues so you guys are all on the same page. And then you usually lead the rehearsal. Um, you're going to do like a table read like they do with like TV shows where you talk through your run of show, make sure it's clear everyone understands what they're supposed to be doing. And then you actually go through a rough kind of tech rehearsal where you check all your graphics, your audio, and what you want to do. And if you have time, you can do a full blown rehearsal with like the client and speakers and things like that. But um, that is really the, the kind of the gist. And then you call the show on event day um, and you're cueing everyone for what to do when, and you follow the cue sheet, but like things are going to go wrong or not according to plan. And you're going to have to improvise a little bit. So you're usually the person that they'll kind of look at um, and like improvise a bit. Let me, what's an example. Uh, when I did volleyball at the Tokyo Olympics, we have to grab the teams to do team intro. And sometimes some of the teams didn't want to come when we asked them to come. They wanted to keep warming up for their game because they're athletes and they're focused on the, the match, not my presentation that needs to happen before the game. And so sometimes they were late according to our run sheet. Now I'm, I'm behind, but it's not like a panic mode. It's like, all right, DJ, keep playing. We are standing by with music. Stage manager, do we have the teams? Do we have the teams? Okay, teams, stand by to change music and graphics in three, two, one, go, send USA, and we're sending the team. So you're that person that is kind of steering the ship during the event. And I have to say, it's been, if you haven't had this experience, it is it is fun. It's obviously professional. People are hiring you for these services, and so you keep it professional. But it's fun to have that, you know, behind the scenes, I don't know, I guess, conversations a little bit here and there. I don't, people, people joke around. Usually it's a fun time, but also you're doing, getting things done. <laughs> you're not yeah. like, there's some banter. The yeah. yeah. You need every, to keep the comms clear, but there's banter and it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Every event has downtime at different times or you've done something and then you're kind of, it's like, hur again, hurry up and wait. And during yeah. that wait, you know, yeah, you can have some banter and, and understand. I mean, I think for like tips for show calling, um, it's just really practice, practice, practice. I will still say, I'm glad that Mary called me an expert, but honestly, I feel like I'm a beginner. <laughs> Um, because again, it's all relative to who you meet, but it's something that I love to do when I get to do it. Um, but like take time. If you never called a show before and you're not the show caller, like practice the next time you're producing an event, like practice talking through the cues yourself or ask to be on whatever channel or app your show caller is using. So you can just listen. That is like the best advice I got when I first got started and was like, how do I do what that person is doing? And, um, the folks I talked to who were doing the show calling jobs I wanted said, just spend time on headset, like spend time listening to other people cue, listening to, and like you can learn and just kind of absorb and then also take it and like practice it yourself. Don't be, don't feel weird if you're like talking to yourself in your house. Cause I've done that so many times <laughs> just to make myself feel better about my cues. Yeah. Great tip about listening and getting started and just hearing it. Couldn't agree more. Any other tips or anything we didn't touch on Logan? Um, I feel like uh, I had two more here for kind of tips, but one was like, don't forget about transitions. We've talked about this before. I've done a YouTube video on it. It's like the number one mistake. I think people think about all their big, their big keynote and their big closing and they forget how am I getting from my keynote to my closing? Like who's doing what? Um, so make sure you talk through this at your rehearsals and like, how do you move from one element to the other? Do they, are they okay if there's no one talking and you're just playing music while one speaker exits the stage, the next one comes on or virtual if you're switching from one speaker to another um, or like will an MC be kind of hosting it all? Um, so just talk through that because it's often, it's not the fun, like meaty stuff of your event, but it's really useful and really helpful to make it feel seamless. Um, and then my last one is just trust your, your instinct when it comes to your experience in events, like trust that you know what you're doing. Don't be afraid to ask questions if you're confused and there's nothing that a quick Google search can't fix because we talk about jargon. 
and you're going to be in meetings with production folks that are going to use words that acronyms, things, whatever you don't understand. If you feel comfortable in the moment, raise your hand, ask that question, say, Hey, do you mind just explaining what that one is? I'm, you know, I want to make sure I'm thinking of the right thing you are, or I've done it in meetings more. I've written it down and I Google it later <laughs> and then I'll know, Oh, they're talking about some, this like very technical piece of software that like, I don't necessarily need to have known about, but it helps me feel again. Like I understand what folks are talking about. Um, or like a production company is using a term you've never heard before. Um, you just want to make sure that you're talking it through. And then in the virtual world, I always, if you can't understand as a producer, how your tech video team moves virtually from one speaker to another, ask them to explain it to you. And like what I mean, like if you're, they're using OBS or VMix, like a software, a video software that's helping them capture video, put graphics on it and push it to your live stream. Like, don't be afraid at, at not right before the show starts, but like at some time to say, hey, can you explain to me how this happens so that you can better manage client expectations of like, we can't just cut from one person to another. We need to, you know, put a slide up or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, it's just have fun. I love them. I love show calling. It's like, honestly, one of my favorite favorite things. Cause I'm with you, Mary. It's like stressful at times, but, uh, super fun. Like after afterward. <laughs> yeah. You know, what would be a fun bonus episode. Don't hold us to this everyone, but I don't know, maybe email us if you want to hear it, but <laughs> I think it'd be cool to do like some mock show show calling bonus episode or something like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think yeah. it'd be cool to be able to hear if you, if you don't have those experiences to listen and maybe we could create that for you. Yeah, no, definitely. Or email us. I know we're always down to help grow the community or like help you get experience. If you're interested in shadowing of any form, you know, we can try to find the right, the right project where it makes sense. If again, you just wanted that time to just like, listen, to be a fly on the wall, because that was, I will say pre COVID, I was trying to find more opportunities to show call, to be on headset. Like I said, have that advice. How do I gain experience? And then COVID hit. And I was like, all right, this has derailed everything I've ever planned. And then I've never been on headset more <laughs> because again, for virtual events, it's even more crucial that you're all like on an auditor, you know, on, on an audio channel, able to listen, convey things really quickly. Cause you don't have those verbal, that help of being verbally in the same space or physically the, in the same space. Um, so that's something that I've never spent more time now in the past two years. And that's helped me feel more comfortable and more confident in my show calling abilities. I will also say if you're someone listening to this and going, I don't want to do any of that. That sounds really stressful and overwhelming. <laughs> totally okay. okay. But yeah. I think it's helpful for you to know what it entails so that you know who to look for or who to ask for. Because again, everyone has different styles. Not every event requires a show caller. Like Mary mentioned, like she's show called events. It's just been when it's like just her or her and another person, you know, we've all done it before and it's just the bigger and more complicated the show gets, the more experience you, you might need, or at least more confidence and ability to make those short, concise calls because you have more things that you're queuing at once. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Logan. I have learned a lot. I hope others have as well. Thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks for this topic. And then I think it's time for our bonus tip, which I have today. And my bonus tip is about Zoom, bringing it back a little bit. But if you did not know, Zoom has something called a Zoom community, which I believe they actually launched in 2021. But it's basically like a forum. Um, if you want to, you know, relate it to Reddit, but for Zoom, that's kind of what it is. But it's it's an official Zoom Um system. And so basically users can find answers, seek support and receive guidance from peers and from others. So it's a great resource if you're a Zoom user, if you do Zoom events. Um, yeah, it's a great place to be able to talk to others and just figure out some tips and tricks about Zoom. So Zoom community, you can access it. I don't believe you can access it through your like Zoom client. You have to like log in to your online portal and then you'll be able to access it from there. It does require a login. So there you go. There is my bonus tip for the day. Very cool. Yeah, we love some some community learning. Like I said, we're all about community. But that brings us to the end of our episode of the Better Events Podcast. Uh, thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Instagram at Better Events Pod. If you want to give us a little present, you can write us a review wherever you listen to podcasts so we can help help other people find us. And you can send us an email at bettereventspod at gmail.com. If you have any follow-up questions, ideas for future episodes, would you guys want to hear what a sample show calling sounds like? Um, but we'll, again, we'll be back in your feeds again next Wednesday. Bye, Thanks folks. everyone.